um, to talk about um, the college and the town. And um, so we have Jeff Rankin. Um, he's been a member of the Monmouth College staff since 1992. He is a historian and also serves as an editor of the college magazine, a lifelong resident of Monmouth and the son of a former director of admissions, Glenn Rankin. He is an authority on local and college history, often speaking and writing about Monmouth lore and tradition. Prior to joining the MC staff, Monmouth College, <laughs> he held a similar position for nine years at Carl Sandburg College in Galesburg. Paul Shudema is the Director of Community and Economic Development for the City of Monmouth with a self-described weird background. <laughs> Paul has an MFA in science fiction writing and has spent much of his life on the computer gaming industry as a writer, designer, and programmer. In 1998, he founded Magic Lantern Playwear in Monmouth, which operated until 2005. He has also worked as director of the Office of Creative Software Development with the University of Illinois Extension and a consultant with the U Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs. In an earlier life, which I don't know how earlier that could have been, he served as Monmouth College's director of student publications for several years. He began his current job with the city in 2010. He also is part of our um, push program, um, which is to end hunger. Um, so he's been a big asset to that to that community here. So <coughs> Jeff and Paul will talk about the dramatic changes in both the campus and downtown landscapes since many of you were students. In the recent decades, both the college and the city have faced unprecedented challenges, and both have seen their ups and downs. Increasingly, though, the fortunes of both the college and the city will be dependent on a healthy, symbiotic relationship. <coughs> As Jeff and Paul will tell you, there is much on the horizon and much to hope for. Please welcome Jeff and Paul. Thank you, Jerry, and it's really wonderful to see so many smiling faces back on campus. It's a gorgeous weekend. Uh, everybody's, I think, having a great time, and I'm sure that will continue. Well, I'm going to start this morning with a shocking revelation. The Monmouth College you knew as students is not the Monmouth College campus of today. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what, how the college has changed since you were here, you know, how, or why it evolved as it did, uh, how it might be evolving in the future, um, and just kind of bring you up to speed on Monmouth College of today. And as you can see, uh, just from the, the very uh, street as you walk up, uh, things look a little different. We have a, a brand new sign that was just unveiled this spring uh, with a new college logo. And um, it, it's kind of a sign of the curb appeal that Mon College has to prospective students uh, as they come here. And it's a, it's a big selling point for our students. But uh, some of you might have seen this map yesterday. This was uh, Doug Carlson's uh, talk about Lincoln. This is Monmouth of the 1860s, and it was kind of all centered around the square, public square up here. Um, there wasn't much uh, east of, of the downtown. It was, uh, you know, it was, it was established as a county seat um, in the 1830s, and, but there was nothing here. It, the town was built specifically to become a, a county seat. So, uh, the town had started to grow pretty rapidly by the early 1850s. In 1851, the railroad came through, and that was the kind of the force that, that drove uh, economic expansion finally. But, and the city was doing pretty well, but the public schools were terrible. I mean, there was, there was really very little educational opportunity here, and the people, uh, the, the business people, the farmers, they were very, uh, they, they just felt that, that for Monmouth to survive and thrive, it needed good educated people. And, and one of the, the harbingers of that was the Presbyterian Church because they believed they had to have a good college to, to train their ministers and their teachers and, and they just believed in education. So that brought about um, a nice partnership uh, that's still going on to this day between the college and the city. And, and as you can see, this was kind of the hub right here and um, one of our early trustees was Abner Harding, and he was an amazing man from the East Coast. He was one of the, along with Ivory Quinby, brought the railroad through Monmouth. He was a, an entrepreneur, he was a, a businessman, and he saw the value of education at Monmouth. So he uh, 
for, with foresight, gave the land for the first Monmouth College, which was down here on South a, on North A Street. And this was, uh, the college had been founded as an academy in 1853. It was more or less a preparatory school. But by 1856, it was so, growing so fast that they couldn't keep up, and there was a real need for it to be a college. So uh, local businessmen uh, got together, um, put up a subscription, and they were, and it was that money that they, they had given that allowed the college to win out in the competition for a Presbyterian Academy. And this is the, the uh, first building, the first Monmouth College that stood on, on North A Street, later uh, would become a soap factory. <laughs> but it was, it was kind of built um, on the, the New England model. There were eight classrooms on the lower level, and the upstairs, the entire upstairs was the chapel, which was very important. Um, but within uh, just a very short amount of time, about three years, uh, this, this building was already uh, overtaxed. It could not support this growing college. And so, um, with the help of some, some alumni who were farmers, this whole east side of Monmouth at the time was just farmland. Sixth Street was the eastern uh, boundary. And two brothers, David and A.Y. Graham, gave 35 acres that, uh, to support this new college. And 10 of those acres would be for the college campus. 25 would be sold as business lots to uh, raise money to build the new building, which was called Old Main in later years. And so that's basically the footprint of, the, this was the, called the Monmouth College addition to the city of Monmouth. And this part here was really the, the college campus as you all knew it, uh, very, very limited, very landlocked. Okay, so we step forward to 1965 and a lot of you were probably getting ready to leave Monmouth College about that time if you hadn't. And this was a, a critical year in the development of the college. And as I mentioned, you know, we were landlocked for many years. The college really hadn't grown much at all. Um, you know, Wallace Hall was built in 1909 to replace the original building that burned. The auditorium was built in 1896. Uh, luckily, the Carnegie Library was built in 1907, which helped uh, the college get by with the, after the fire. And then 1910, McMichael Science Hall was built. And then uh, we had a few additions. We had a heating plant in 1903. We had a gymnasium, which became a little theater in 1903. Uh, and then the, the old gymnasium was built in 1925. So this was really the physical plant of Monmouth College. It hadn't changed much. Uh, we did add also um, some dormitories along 9th Street. And those were kind of late coming. The first one was McMichael Hall in 1914. It was just, you know, it was important to have a place for the young women, but the men either lived, you know, in town, boarded, or lived in fraternity houses. So there really wasn't a whole lot there, but it was a, it was a critical year. The previous year, uh, Dr. Gibson had retired, and President Duncan Wimpress had come in as the next president. Young president, vibrant, he was like 42 years old, and he had visions of, of grandeur for Monmouth College. And by right, he should, because the GI Bill was done. Um, it brought in this influx of, of students. We had a lot of really great chemistry majors out there in the world. And the college was growing. I mean, there was a, a big uh, influx of students. And so he, uh, when he first came, we were in the middle of a capital campaign. And it was going to expand the science hall, the Michael Hall. This was where it was going to go, and they had already raised money for it. Well, first thing he said, now cancel that. He says, I've been to bigger schools, and I've seen their science buildings, and that's not the science building of the future. So he said, uh, we'll put that on hold, and we'll raise money to build a, a great new science hall, which you, you've seen. It was our Hall of Mantison uh, building completed in the early 1970s. <clears throat> and then, um, but he also saw there was a, you know, with, with all these students, we had to build more dormitories. And uh, he also was interested in getting the Greek system kind of consolidated and building a, a complex for fraternities at, at 9th and Broadway. That was a pretty controversial idea at the time. I think a lot of the Greeks fought that idea, but in the end, they, they won through. 
And so in the late 60s, they built along there the, our newer buildings, which were uh, Cleveland Hall, Leadman Hall, Fraternity Complex. And then in 1965, uh, Gibson Hall was built here on the corner of Archer and uh, 7th Street. And it was, it was an interesting building. Some of you remember the great Holiday Inn caper uh, when the, the students procured a sign uh, on Dedication Day, Parents Day in 1960, the spring of 66. And um, President Gibson graciously allowed the sign to stay uh, for the ceremony. But anyway, uh, to, to step forward, uh, the, the fact that all this expansion was happening, it wasn't free and the administration had to take out government loans. And that, that created, would create some real problems for Monmouth College because we got up to about a 1,300 enrollment in 1969, and then all of a sudden enrollment started precipitously declining. I mean, uh, all of a sudden there was a state university system in New, in New York, New Jersey, uh, drained away a lot of our incoming students. The war was, the draft deferments were changing. And all of a sudden, uh, we had all these empty dorms that we couldn't fill, and we had debt. We had a heavy debt on all these government loans. So by the 1970s, uh, they actually even had trouble with the new science building getting it occupied because they had to pay the builders. They would, couldn't get loans to do it. So things were pretty uh, intense at that time. Uh, people wondered, would the college survive? And thankfully, it did. Um, but by the 70s, Fulton Hall closed, Graham Hall closed, and we were, you know, we were on sort of a, you know, I guess a skeleton uh, uh, campus, uh, you know, just kind of getting by, uh, very little new construction at all, just kind of um, treading water, and um, we, we had had some master planning done in the 60s, but it just kind of stood there, nothing really happened. At one time, they were going to take the old chapel and turn it into the theater, and they were going to build a new chapel right over here. Well, that, that kind of sparked an inspiration, which would be the first new building in many years, and that was in 1990 when the Wells Theater was built right over in here. And as a result, the Little Theater was demolished. But again, uh, things were pretty much at a standstill. Enrollment was having some real problems in the early 90s. And so not, nothing else much was done. And then thankfully, we had some great people come here with some great ideas. And all of a sudden, we got our enrollment going again. And that made a huge difference. Plus, we had an amazing board of trustees, very, very uh, wise uh, business people who, who understood the business of, of finance. And they came up with a plan called the Monmouth Plan, which basically gave uh, Monmouth students the ability to enroll at Monmouth for the same cost as their flagship state institution. So all those things helped. And so by the mid-90s, we were starting to, to see an increase, starting to see things dig out a little bit. And that was kind of the start of, of a new era. 1995, all of a sudden, uh, we took Graham Hall out of mothballs. We had an incoming class we needed to, to house. They, they did some nice uh, cosmetic work on it, uh, made it you know, a nice, comfortable building again. 1996, the old Carnegie Library uh, received a real nice facelift and made it really a serviceable building again. Um, over the years, it had kind of gone into a bit of a decline. Um, the, the, the student bookstore was put on the, the main level. Upstairs was an experimental theater called the Red Barn East, uh, playing on the uh, Red Barn, which was the theater to the west. Um, and it really wasn't in very good shape. The student affairs was still located in there, but it, it wasn't a very functional building. So uh, with a gift from Red Poling, uh, class of 49, uh, CEO of the Ford Motor Company, we were able to do a nice renovation. They did a really sensitive renovation and built a, an extension on the east uh, to accommodate an elevator, and they did an amazing job matching the original architecture. So we were really proud of this, and this was also the start of our uh, really expanded career center, the Wackerly Career and Leadership Center that Fred Wackerly helped establish, um, and it was located on the top floor of that building. 
1997, things continued to improve a little bit. Quinby House had become, and it was given to the college in 66 by the wonderful Quinby family of Monmouth. Um, it, had, it had seen uh, better days. Uh, the, there were groundhogs uh, nearby that tunneled under the porches and munched on the carpeting and everything. It was just not good. And so with the help of a gift and, and also a grant from the state of Illinois, because Ivory Quinby was one of the people that got the railroad through uh, Monmouth. And so it was a, a, a historic grant, um, a transportation grant that helped us renovate. And so uh, during the, the presidency, after Bruce Haywood, the building remained vacant, and that was through the entire term of President Sue Huseman. So it wasn't until uh, Richard Giese became our president in 1997 that it was first occupied. But they did an amazing job. They really gutted the interior and put in all new mechanicals, but did it sensitively and, ma and made it um, a very livable building. 1997, again, uh, this was our first big dorm renovation. And McMichael Hall, which was, I mean, you remember McMichael, it, it was a great building. I mean, it, it's solid. The original dining hall was in the lower level. Uh, originally, it was built with a basketball court on the top floor for the women they used, so they had their own basketball court. It had a trunk room. It had, you know, just everything. And, you know, it had seen better days, too, and it needed a really thorough renovation. You know, they had to install an elevator. They had to do all these things. And so this was really our first really big project. And it, it kind of opened people's eyes that, yeah, you know, we can think, we can dream a little bigger. We can raise funds, uh, you know, to make Monmouth really uh, beyond what anybody ever imagined it could be. And, that, and then it was about 1998 when, when Richard Giese came, and he was our first probably our first true fundraiser. I mean, he really understood fundraising. He knew how to ask, you know, for money. He knew how to get board members who were smart and who, you know, knew investment, that sort of thing. And, and when he came, I mean, he, one of his interests, he came from Mount Union, and, you know, he was interested in athletics, and the athletic facilities were terrible. I remember his first day on the job, he went out and toured the athletic facilities. He says they were worse than he even imagined. So, <laughs> You know, he talked to the board, and, and they kind of came to the conclusion the smart thing to do would be, let's get our athletic facilities first class, let's get our campus looking great, you know, whatever buildings are here, let's make them first class, and then we'll work on, you know, the academic uh, reputation and all that, but let's really focus on making the campus great. And that was probably his, his legacy at Monmouth. Whoops, what did I do? Did I just turn it off? Okay, so um, he began, this was again the, sort of the end of uh, the landlocked issue. I, I don't know how many times I heard in the 90s, you know, well, Monmouth College can never expand because you're landlocked. Well, he saw beyond that, and he, he envisioned a larger campus, um, a place where we could build new buildings that were all sensitive to the great Georgian architecture that we had here, um, make it a beautiful walking campus. And so, I mean, it was really kind of a, an ambitious idea, but to actually um, buy up what had become residential neighborhoods and, and gradually turn them back into college campus. And ironically, a lot of this was part of the original college addition to Monmouth, so the college owned a lot of this to begin with, sold off the lots so that they would have the capital to build the building. But anyway, it was done um, over a period of time. You know, there's always uh, controversy over taking buildings off the tax roll. Yeah, we are, but we're, we're building this industry for Monmouth that's, you know, couldn't be equal, really, uh, with any other industry uh, here. As far as the culture of the town and the, you know, employment of, of really uh, upstanding citizens who are going to buy good homes and, and make our town something special. So over the years, and we even you know moved some houses um, so they didn't get torn down. And then uh, we began just a series of every summer you'd hear banging and crashing and you know construction noises. It just became sort of a regular thing you expected in the summer at Monmouth College. And so every year there was some project. The old ATO house was turned into the Mellinger, Mellinger Center uh, through the assistance of David Fleming, who was. Uh, president of the Mellinger Educational Foundation at that time, uh, began a really nice 
partnership with that organization. Before they had only really focused on giving scholarships, and they did a great job giving scholarships to Monmouth College uh, students. But um, we've had some really nice partnerships with them over the years. Stockdale Center was built in 1963. It's had problems ever since. It was built over a, a stream. We've had flooding. <laughs> but they did some really nice renovations in 99. Um, new dining hall, new downstairs where the sticks used to be. Um, so that, that changed. And then, of course, parking. Parking is, is kind of it's been our uh, headache all these years. You know, now in your day, a lot of most kids didn't have cars, you know, and, and but the reality of today is kids got to have a car or they're going to go elsewhere. Um, I, well, I think that's changing a little bit. I think more and more of our students are leaving their cars at home and, you know, relying on other transportation. We, we even have a bicycle loan program that they can check out through bicycles called Scott's Cruisers. So... <laughs> So that's kind of us, but we were building parking uh, to accommodate um, the, the extra students. Uh, beautiful gift in 2000 from Saf and Betty Peacock in honor of their parents. Um, uh, this was a field out on, um, at the corner of Route 34 and 11th Street, and the college had actually owned the land since the 60s because the original plan was we're going to build the football stadium out there on the bypass. And we'll put um, like baseball where the football field is and some other things. Um, so it had been just cornfield all those years. And they did an, a, a, a remarkable amount of earth moving to get that uh, to, the, to the quality it is today. And, we, and then we have two soccer fields to the east. And then um, also the Boone House. And some of you may have had classes with Commander and Mrs. Boone teaching in their home over on 9th Street Extended. Um, in our East Asian Studies program. Uh, that was given to the college and renovated, and we've used it as a nice retreat center within walking distance of the campus. And then uh, uh, we, we started to have some trustees who really stepped forward and wanted to make an impact, like a, a, a permanent impact on campus and on the students and, and the quality of life. And Dave Bowers was the first one to really do that. He built the hall where many of you are standing, uh, took a real personal interest in it, still maintains a personal interest in it, making sure the furnishings are up to date and that sort of thing. And uh, really a first class uh, building, um, nothing that Monmouth had ever seen before. And then in 2001, we did some more minor renovations. We did more Stockdale Center. The plaza in front of the library and the football stadium was, was built. As you may have seen, we have a new Scotsman statue where that little fountain used to stand. That was a gift of the class of 2015, and it was just dedicated at homecoming. It's called Scott's Pride. Or Scott's Spirit, I'm sorry. Scott's Spirit. Um, okay, and then um, 2002 uh, was really continued. Uh, the Hughes Library renovation was really a remarkable improvement. As you may, if you were here in the late 60s when it was built, you remember the style of architecture of that time was to build a fortress. And so you built this tall thing with no windows and you know, little crenellated uh, openings and things like that. And it just wasn't conducive to modern uh, students today or the look of the campus. So they did some really nice work opening up, putting in 36 new big windows, bringing light into the place. Um, and the other thing that happened was when it was built, they could not afford to finish the top floor of the building. It was just concrete, and we stored our government documents up there. So for the first time, that whole top floor was finished, done really nicely. Uh, we put in an archives, art galleries, a museum area. And so it's really a first-class facility. It continues to, uh, to improve, um, and we now have a really nice Einstein bagel shop in there. Um, you know, we kind of we're kind of entered the area the era of a library is more like a coffee shop where people can come and relax and read newspapers and talk and that sort of thing. It's not the old you know sh sh the kind of thing in <laughs> the old days, uh, Miss Bradford. Um, <laughs> we had a state of the art tennis stadium, a million dollar stadium put in at that time on that, and it kind of helped anchor that new uh, northwest part of campus. And a, and a parking lot there where you're parked uh, right now. 
And also, um, 2002, Bill LeSueur from the class of 1943 uh, and his wife uh, purchased 16 and a half acres of land adjoining our new Peacock Park. And they worked with the biology department and uh, turned their, I mean, it's an ongoing project, but turning it into an area for studying different habitats. There, there's, I think, five different uh, biological habitats that are represented there. And we are still, our biology folks are still planting native plants, pulling out stuff that's not native. And there's a nice one mile track that you can walk kind of through there, go over a couple of bridges. And it's just a nice little area, kind of a, a little known um, gem that some people know about, not everybody. Okay, this was, this was the big headline from Honest College. Um, Walter Huff, class of 56, and, and I think it was 1983, had given the, the biggest gift to the college ever, $5 million, which was a remarkable thing at that time. I mean, it was one of the biggest uh, private gifts in the nation uh, for that year. Um, but he stepped forward again. His, his wife, Elizabeth, had died, um, and, you know, as a memorial, he decided, you know, this is, we're going to follow through with this whole athletic wellness, fitness thing. Um, it's going to be a great recruiting tool. And we built this remarkable, I think it was a $22 million facility at the time. And the great thing was it incorporated the old buildings. They didn't tear them down. They kept the old gym. They kept the pillars. Uh, they kept the 1983 uh, Glenny Gymnasium. But it was all in this coherent uh, package that's you know, not only convenient, but just aesthetically very exciting and pleasing. And in 2004, this was our first sort of uh, off-campus living. Uh, we purchased a private apartment complex. Uh, Upper-class students who are doing well can live there, and they have their own kitchens and can cook and all that sort of thing. Uh, then uh, President Ditzler, Maury Ditzler, came in 2005. Uh, we finished Patti Hall, where some of you are staying. And uh, also the, the manor that used to be President uh, Gibson's house uh, was renovated. It's now a guest house. Austin Hall, the old music building, was renovated. Uh, Fleming Plaza, Dave Fleming gave uh, some uh, a gift to, to kind of beautify that back hillside behind uh, Wallace Hall. It's a nice sort of outdoor classroom. And then uh, 2007, we had another wonderful gift that allowed us to name our other new dorm after the legendary Gracie Peterson, class of 22. We built another parking lot on the site of the old Monmouth Hospital. It had, uh, it, it had actually got, become a nursing home after the new hospital was built in 65. It, it went through a couple of changes of ownership and it was sitting empty. So we did a little trading with a company that, that owned it and we purchased it and built another parking lot to help uh, accommodate our students. And then Weeks House, another private house, was purchased with a gift and named after Stafford and Winifred Weeks, who many of you will remember. It was our longtime chaplain and professor of religion. So that houses the office of the chaplain and the philosophy and religious uh, classrooms. And then in 2009, Walter Huff again stepped forward after his first wife died, he had met another former student that, uh, from his era, April Zorn. They got married. They had a wonderful marriage. Sadly, she died of cancer, and so he honored her with building this wonderful football stadium that has field turf, beautiful press boxes, lights, everything. And it's just been a, a great asset to not just, not just for athletics, but our marching band uses it. Um, it's used by the community. Um, it's just track and field, whatever. So it's, it's great. And then we uh, continued again um, the Alpha Z Delta House in 2010. And it was built on the side of the old Woodbine, which had been torn down. They tried to kind of keep that Queen Anne uh, character of the architecture. And um, it was kind of the start of what we called our Greek Life Initiative. And the idea is. We really want to promote Greek life because it encourages retention, it encourages good academics, and it's something we're, we're kind of continuing to promote. Also, some of you saw the Educational Garden uh, yesterday. That was when we first got a grant to establish that. Uh, 2011, we did some renovation on the old admissions building. 
It used to be, um, there was an annex on the back that was removed, but it's, it's um, much, much more modern inside, much more conducive to uh, prospective students who are visiting. And we built another parking lot over on 11th Street on a vacant area that the college had owned for years. Uh, we began our market farm. Some of you might have seen that yesterday in 2012. That thing is growing very nicely. It's expanding and it's going to have all kinds of great produce. And then um, sort of our crowning achievement, 2013, the uh, Center for Science and Business, 138,000 square feet. It incorpor incorporates the sciences, it incorporates business, accounting, and also some other departments uh, such as sociology are in that building and it's a, it's a collaborative uh, neighborhood and we're in it now. This, build, this room gets a lot of use with community lectures, all kinds of things uh, all throughout the year. And then uh, 2014, we, helped, we wanted to help with downtown restoration, which Paul will talk about. We, uh, we worked with a private developer to uh, remake what was the old uh, Rowland Scott store downtown. And um, we currently lease it, but it's a beautiful uh, experimental theater space in there. You can do all kinds of things. It's got a beautiful gallery. And then just this April, we just dedicated our new uh, Pi Beta Phi house. Just a glorious thing. I hope some of you got to see it uh, yesterday. Um, Harold Napide, our one of our former trustees and his sister uh, gave this in, in uh, memory of their mother who was a Pi Phi. And it really, um, it's, a, it's, it's a gorgeous facility. It's, it's going to be featured in the National Pi Phi magazine, The Arrow, coming up. So, And just to give you one kind of last quick glance, a lot of you will remember the college like this. We had streets going through, we had College Place, we had, uh, you could actually drive through the campus and go from 7th Street to 9th Street, and you could go down here to what was called the Yale Bowl and, and Detroit. So all this yellow now is now grass, pretty much. And uh, the plan had been, when they took out College Place, they were going to use, perhaps use this area to build some new residence uh, facilities, maybe uh, Greek uh, life. But when, uh, when they did that, they thought, this is a beautiful expanse. And President Ditzler had come here from Wabash College, and they had this beautiful kind of mall down the middle of their college. And he said, we, we should preserve that, plant trees and that sort of thing. So I think that was a, a wise idea. And this is what we have today in that space. So it really kind of gives that whole, it gives it some spaciousness and a park-like feel. And when those trees grow up to be mature, it's going to really, really pop. So anyway, just to uh, give you a quick glimpse back and forward, this was the campus you probably knew or close to it, and this is the campus of today, so quite a dramatic difference. So thank you, I hope uh, that was of some help. And we'll get right on to Paul, I probably went over my time a little bit. Yeah, and thanks Jeff, and uh, yeah, we, we both, uh, can't stop talking. So it's, and, and I thought I would, I would start uh, my section of, of this conversation with uh, confessing a horrible secret in my past. Uh, when I left college, I went to Knox College. <laughs> but I didn't graduate there. So, so I graduated from Miami of Ohio, and uh, now I kind of bleed the, uh, the red and white, so it's okay. Uh, so I just wanted to Confess that, so in case you saw me sweating up here. <laughs> uh, so I mean, we're calling this Monmouth's Downtown Resident Renaissance. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is really uh, not maybe the last 30 or 40 years, but the last five or six years downtown. Uh, what we've tried to do as a community and where we think we're going as a community, where it's going over the next five years. And um, starting off with this, this kind of odd picture, and I always get people asking, why is that a front porch? Well, I think really our downtown and small communities are the front porch of the 21st century. You're not really sitting on those neighborhood front porches anymore, but you're gathering together for fellowship downtown. And that's kind of a guiding principle for what we want to see in our community is, 
is not only the college and the community coming together on campus, but also in our downtown, because that's sort of the shared heart of our community. So I want to start looking back a little bit, and I stole some of these graphs from, um, from Jeff. Uh, these are showing, what is it, this is the unemployment rate and the gross domestic product, uh, and these bars here are the last recessions. And the reason I stuck that up there was uh, just to kind of remind us all that, that the economies in our country and our small communities like Monmouth are always cyclical. And uh, th there's been some changes and some challenges maybe in the last 10 or 15 years that we're just starting to sort out. So one thing that downtown Monmouth is blessed with is a lot of mature old building stock, you know, 1890s, 1860s, beautiful old buildings. And um, before the 2008 recession, there were some amazing retail businesses downtown. And you may remember coming back for a, a homecoming or a reunion or something, and remember the, uh, the Maple City Candy Company and Touch a Country. These two retail businesses alone downtown occupied 10 retail spaces downtown, just between those two businesses. They were absolutely sort of the heartbeat of our downtown when we're talking about the late 90s, the early 2000s. Um, but then, you know, we all got hit with that blindsided with what happened in 2008. And some of the things that you stop buying when you belt tighten are Beanie Babies and candy. And uh, th these businesses weren't designed really to be recession proof. And for various reasons, they had to close out because of that last recession. And what we were left with was basically that. Uh, this is from 2010, and not that they did anything wrong with these buildings, but they've been in there for a while, and if any of you own 100-year-old buildings in a downtown, you know that that is a, it's a thankless, extraordinarily expensive thing to maintain. Um, and we had, you know, decades of water damage. Um, the nicest bathroom in downtown. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was actually a, a stove for a kitchen for a restaurant downtown. But things were collapsing. Things were kind of falling apart. Um, though there were good things happening. And, but one of the things we wanted to, to realize when we started looking at this was after the 2008 recession, the economies really changed. Really in these small communities as well. Um, on the retail side of things, which is one of the heartbeats of downtown, uh, big box stores and online retail beats small retailers on price every time. You just can't compete. The only way retail works in a small downtown is if it's a niche, if it's offering something unique, a place to go to that you can't easily get online. So retail also needs to become a destination. And you've all been to those places like Galena or something where they make it an awesome place to go to. Um, customer service is king. You can't just expect people to go in and buy stuff. You have to give that value-added experience. And another realistic thing is franchises, things like your Sonics, your Culver's, and things like that. They rarely are interested in rural downtowns. They're interested in new buildings that they build. I mean, they're, they're still interested in a community like Monmouth, like maybe around the bypass, but not in that downtown area. So I put this thing up. Is this a glass half empty or a glass half full? Or if you're an engineer, there's a glass that's twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm an optimist, so that's a glass half full. So we, we had a solid foundation. I mean, there's some challenges. You saw those buildings, but we had a solid foundation. What were some of the things that were making me think it was half, half full? Well, one, and yes, my boss is the mayor, but we have a really fiscally responsible uh, municipal government that does a whole lot with not much. And um, if any of you are still fortunate enough to live in the state of Illinois, you know that thriving as a municipality in our oh-so-functional state is a challenge. <laughs> so we, we maintain a balanced budget. Uh, it's, it's so that's going for us. That's great. Obviously, we have Monmouth College. Um, and this is really a jewel, and, and Jeff really hit on it. It's, it's sort of the, the, the cultural heartbeat of our community. Uh, also, great jobs, and there's a real sense of collaboration going forward. Um, we also have strong bypass growth, 34 that goes around our community. Uh, we were, by just geography, lucky. If you've seen a lot of small towns that have bypasses put around them, sometimes they may be a mile or two outside of that town, and the town vanishes. You can't see the town. 
Our bypass goes right around Monmouth. You can see the community. It feels like it's part of it. So we've had lots of good growth on the bypass, which brings in sales tax dollars, keeps the economy humming. And we are also unbelievably fortunate to have Smithfield Foods. Um, pigs come in, bacon goes out. Um, and talk about a recession-proof business. I mean, bacon, no matter what, you need bacon. <laughs> And one of the things I used to, when I first moved to Monmouth, and if you remember it or if you've been here when there's the, the mysterious smell that comes from Smithfield, I it used to drive me absolutely crazy. Now I smell money. Uh, I mean, it's 1,800 full-time jobs there. It's the largest employer in a nine-county region right here in Monmouth. What's even cooler about it is we actually landed a whale, and that's the economic development term of a huge project. Uh, Cloverleaf Cold Storage came in and uh, basically built and designed one of the most advanced cold storage warehouses in the world, specifically to service a dozen Smithfield plants. So basically all Smithfield bacon and stuff from 13 plants comes into Monmouth, a thousand trucks a week, and then gets distributed out to Walmarts and things like that. This is the loading dock. Those are where the trucks back up. The freezer and the coolers are on the other side. That's the loading, the largest uh, cold storage loading dock that's ever been built anywhere. That's right here in Monmouth. The cool thing about this is it was, uh, the mayor had been working on this for years and it took us maybe two and a half years of day-to-day -day work to bring this in, but it, we didn't bring this in for the jobs, though that's really cool because Steve wanted jobs and you know he's a big burly guy, he can beat me up, so I was like, we gotta get jobs here. Um, but what we did was by anchoring this to the Smithfield plant, and it's directly connected to the plant, it's going to be much harder for that huge employer to leave the area because their distribution center is now here. So that was really the end game for that. Um, we also have, and this is kind of a, a personal thing I threw up here, why is, do I have a business, Market Alley Wines? Well, first full disclosure, my wife owns Market Alley Wines. <laughs> So go there, spend your dollars, you got, you got some time this afternoon. But really what we tried to do when I started working um, as the de uh, Director of Economic Development, uh, Jerry said I have a weird background. I, I'm not qualified for my job at all. I know how to make computer games. So basically I'm playing SimCity with real taxpayer dollars. So we decided when I was going to be talking about how to get retail and small businesses working downtown, I better know what I'm talking about. So my wife and I started Market Alley Wines as a crucible for experimentation. Um, it's retail, there's food, there's liquor. Um, so I also am fortunate enough to have a gorgeous smart wife with a liquor license. That is awesome. Um, but it's a place where we can try out ideas and get data so we can advise new retail businesses. This is how it works in Monmouth. We also have a really vibrant multinational community. Um, Smithfield Foods um, recruits people from lots of different countries. At Smithfield Foods, there are 14 different languages spoken. The most prevalent after English are Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Burmese. In Monmouth Roosevelt High School, 23% of the students are Hispanic, 7% Burmese, 7% Sub-Saharan African. That's 37% of the high school class have parents that were not born in the U.S. That's an amazing cultural asset to our community. So we put together, knowing some of this stuff, um, a plan going forward, and this was about 2010, to say what can we do with all of that, that glass half full to make things work? And we put together some core principles, and if someone's heard me talk, you kind of, I, I live and breathe and yammer this stuff constantly, which is acknowledging that downtown is the heart of our community, that a healthy downtown supports the college. A healthy college supports downtown. Restoring those old buildings is key. Upper floor residential living in those old buildings is key to be able to make those cash flow for the building owners. Gap funding, funding from public sources like the city or USDA or something is essential to make that renovation work happen. You gotta make downtown look beautiful, like the campus now looks beautiful. Downtown has to be beautiful. We need targeted niche businesses, we need to take care of our existing businesses, and we need arts and culture in a strong way downtown to drive people downtown. So those were our principles that we put together a plan, five-year strategic plan, and 
We wrapped that up in 2015, and this is kind of what happened, and I'll kind of get into some of the details, but we renovated 16 buildings downtown, 12 market rate apartments that never existed, had a successful business competition, there's great live music now happening, successful events, we have a vibrant art center, we've got some third place businesses, which I'll talk about those in a minute, great theater spaces downtown, a growth in ethnic owned businesses, and we're plus 12 in retail sway, and I'll get what that means. But the big thing is, and for a small town, college spends a lot of money in these buildings that are really expensive. When you're talking downtown, uh, we've had four million in total redevelopment downtown, and that's huge for a community like us. So, I'm showing some, this is really kind of cool, because these are 100-year-old buildings being outfitted with actual, real, like, wires and conduits and, and good framing. And uh, this is a great picture I love because this is the old Second National Bank building on the square. That's what it looked like in 2010. That's what it looks like today. It's just an absolutely beautiful improvement. They actually restored all of the windows. Um, they didn't put new windows in there. They actually took all of those out, restored them, epoxy, injected them, and everything like that. It's a beautiful space. Loft-style apartments downtown. There's 12 loft-style apartments. We've got like rooftop hangout areas, they've got granite countertops, wood floors, tin ceilings, they're all full, every single one of them. And they're all market rate apartments, so they're not cheap, but they're not outrageously expensive either. We had a business competition, and it was basically to trigger um, retail growth and retail development to find out who are those people who maybe could open a business, but didn't have the helping and the mentoring. And we had over 30 local sponsors put together a prize package of about $30,000. And we had 18 businesses that didn't exist, but go through the process to see if they could uh, start their business. And the whole thing ended, they had to do business plans and stuff, with a two minute Shark Tank style pitch in the Fusion Theater. And I don't think anyone's ever seen the Fusion Theater as packed as it was for that event. It was standing room only. They used all the spare chairs. People were sitting on the floor. Uh, this is one of the finalists who was also one of the winners, and he is freaking out with fear right now. Uh, there are the judges right there. But it was so cool to see the community come out and support these retail entrepreneurs that wanted to try something different. We also have absolutely great live music. There are, uh, there's a, a regular occurring uh, dueling pianos event that comes. We have a world-class blues festival. Uh, the art center has guitar workshops. There's venues downtown that have live music every Friday and Saturday. Um, so if you're, you know, you get done with your festivities here, come on downtown. There's some cool stuff happening. And live music is one of those great things that's a, it's a driver of people downtown, um, but it also kind of brings the community together, and that's, that's really awesome. And we've got some really cool events going on. If anyone's ever been here for our cruise night, it's the first Friday in August. Um, it's, it's sort of an odd scratch-your-head phenomenon. Thousands of, of cool, tricked-out cars come, and 30,000 people decide to descend on the city just to look at those cars and eat funnel cakes. It's just, it's the craziest thing, but it's so cool. Um, we've got an event series in the summer called Market Alley Music Days where we bring live music with uh, box lunches to downtown. And last year we tried, and, and you'll hear me later talk about lean methodologies, but we tried an experiment with a, an event called Bacon Fest, because you know, Smithfield, Bacon. We thought we would have a Bacon Festival downtown, and we figured this first one, we're not advertising it too much, we're just gonna try it out. We figured maybe 350 people, maybe 400 would come. We had over 3,000 people show up. It was a two block long line. They ran out of bacon in like 30 minutes. Was, <laughs> but everybody was so happy because everyone smelled like bacon. It was just, I mean, just imagine 3,000 people that smell like bacon. And I apologize to any vegans, but that's cool. <laughs> so our art center, we have an absolutely amazing uh, cultural and civic art center. And we've really been blessed that our last two executive directors have really taken it from a small kind of rinky regional art center to something that is absolutely world class with gallery space, national juried art exhibits, um, just great public spaces that we could use for events and everything like that. I mean, it's a real jewel in our community. So I was talking before about third places, and this is again 
the wine shop. Uh, one of the unexpected things that happened um, as we're looking at what makes a retail hum in a small community are these places that are hangouts. I mean, you've probably all been to like that coffee shop that's really cool or the bookstore that's really cool. Well, you just want to be there because, you know, your first place is your home. Your second place is your work. Your third place is at home away from home. It's Cheers. It's where Norm goes to hide from his life. <laughs> and inadvertently, that wine store and a couple other businesses have become those places. They're equalizers. There's really no class level. It's a place where a blue collar worker can sit next to Clarence Wyatt, president of Monmouth College, drink a Shiner Bach, and talk about rock and roll. How cool is that? And that happens on a regular basis here. We also have some great theaters. We've got the Rivoli Theater downtown. It was an old vaudeville theater. That's now this great multi-use venue. The college uses it. Community events are there. Um, and they're looking to kind of re resurrect this as a brew and view movie theater as well. So you could watch some, like, if he's like second run things, like a weekend of John Wayne movies with some, some beer, that sounds like a good time. And Jeff talked about the Fusion Black Box Theater. That's an absolutely amazing space. And this is kind of what the inside of the theater space looks like. It's completely reconfigurable into theater in the round, standard theaters. Um, it's got a great lobby area um, where you can have art exhibits, and it has, honestly, the coolest bathrooms downtown. <laughs> they spent a lot of money in those bathrooms. They're awesome. And ethnic owned businesses. You know, we've got this growing ethnic population, but we have, right now in Monmouth, we have two authentic Mexican restaurants. I mean, when I talk authentic, you can get a tripe and cactus taco. Authentic stuff. And another one's on the way. And it takes a certain greater person to have a tripe and cactus taco. <laughs> There's three authentic Hispanic grocery stores, one dedicated Asian grocery store, one African grocery store, and one combination Asian-African grocery store, which is this right on the square. Um, that is so important for that community that, those are the, the third places for that community. But it also is a place for the communities to come together because food is one of those great connectors. And you can get the best ethnic ingredients in Monmouth that you can't even get anywhere else. And it's awesome. This is a, a, a sort of a, a hit list. This document's actually quite longer than this, but I've been keeping this since 2010. I track every business that's opened and every business that's closed in the last, uh, well, since 2010. Right now we're plus 17, that's what that retail sway is. We've got 17 more businesses open than closed. But I keep this list to sort of sober myself up and realize there's always gonna be businesses closing. What you wanna do is keep that machine going and then get those ones that can click and can be there, that can go past five years. And uh, on Monday, the, uh, the wine shop hits its five year anniversary and that's that big hump that if you can get over that, then you're smooth sailing. So, that was kind of the results of our first five year plan. And it worked, so it's time to do it again. We actually put together a strategic plan that goes from 2016 through 2020. And I'm gonna show you some of the stuff of where we're going right now. Um, first thing we did though to put together this plan, and um, you know, you guys all know this is important, you can't try to revive a community unless you're doing what the community wants. So we went out there, we had a group of uh, dedicated people, both from the college and the community, worked to put together the strategic plan, did a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews, business owners, community members, did a really comprehensive online survey, uh, had an event survey at Bacon Fest. All the survey results smell like bacon. They're still in my drawer, I just, it's delicious. Uh, and then we had a community engagement event, and if you know something over here, free pizza will be provided. Uh, it's amazing how many members of the community you can come out to get share their ideas if you have free pizza. And yes, there was some bacon pizza. So five pillars of this new plan. Business development, physical restoration of those old buildings, arts and culture, community development, bringing us together, and marketing, telling the larger world why we're cool. And one of the coolest things that we heard a couple years ago um, I was in some forum in Galesburg, and they, everybody was putting down their worries. It was kind of one of those proctored things, and one of the questions was, what's the biggest threat to Galesburg? And someone put up there, Monmouth. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting next to the president of the college, and he just goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was pretty cool. So, some of our key concepts. We're focusing on downtown and our revitalization. Why? We're not, it's not that we're 
We are not interested in bypass growth, but that's the shared heart of our community. That's the front porch. It's based on our best practices for the, 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 what we learned over the last five years. It's based on those core principles that I shared with you. It's a realization that there's many stakeholders. This isn't just the city or the college or business X or business Y, it's all of us. And we're embracing lean methodologies. And if any of you guys are sort of like entrepreneurship or business geeks, you'll recognize that term. It's kind of a new term in startup businesses, which is you, you try something as lean, mean, and cheap as possible to prove your concept before you invest too much money in it. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do downtown, like that bacon fest. You try it cheap to see if it's going to be sustainable. And realizing that the path forward is based on multiple projects. So here it is, drum roll please. There's the plan. Um, that actually exists as a giant poster, almost that big in my office, to kind of guide me every day. But you can go online to cityofmonmouth.com and see the narrative of this entire thing if you're interested in the nuts and bolts, because um, it's all over the place, but you can see physical restoration, business development, marketing, community development, arts and culture. So some of the things that are, are in, in the world that are happening. We're getting real world data. We're updating the data so we can know how businesses are actually working and thriving in our community. We're recruiting new retail. We're trying to take that data and share it with existing businesses so they know what's going on. We're going to have another business competition because that was awesome. And it led to businesses opening from that competition. They're open. Um, if you go downtown and check out Mod Speckle Bellies, they are one of the winners of that business competition. And that's an amazing business. We're going to create a maker space and co-working space. I'll, I'll talk about that in a few. We're going to start up the CEO program. Again, I'll get into more details. Uh, our Rotary Club is coming on Centennial. Uh, their Centennial gift to the community is going to be a really beautiful, original new fountain sculpture right in the center of town, Public Square. Uh, Patti Plaza is a thing that's underway right now, a beautiful plaza downtown. Uh, we're working on implementing a festival ordinance. And what that means is when you go to Bacon Fest, you can wander around with a beer. So, I mean, it's basically the math is not hard. You add those two things together, it's a good time. Uh, more market rate apartments, we've got, what's it, 13 more in the queue to be developed. So we figure our downtown can hold about 27 to 30 market rate apartments. And with the influx of new faculty members for the college, I mean, that's a great place. They can rent for a year or two, then decide, okay, I'm going to buy something. We're updating our city's brand, and we're trying to make downtown more beautiful. I'm going to show that to you in a little, a few here. The data gathering, what does this mean? It means you can actually now figure out exactly how much money is being spent currently in our retail trade area, which is about five miles around Monmouth. What's actually being spent in the area? Um, how much of it is going outside of the area? And what is that, what they call the surplus? And what that means is, say, an example of televisions. There's about $2 million spent on like stereos and televisions in our Monmouth area. 100% of that is spent outside of Monmouth. It's spent at like a Best Buy or on Amazon or something. That's one of those things where that's probably not a business opportunity because you're never going to be able to compete with the price of a Best Buy. And uh, you know, it's, those are kind of like one and done purchases. But look at something like um, women's clothing. We've got 1.7 million being spent on women's clothing. Only about 8,000 of that is being spent within Monmouth. So you've got $1.7 million on women's clothing being spent by people in Monmouth outside of the community. There's an opportunity that says, wow, I can capture that and start a business. So we're using this to really figure out what's happening. Retail recruitment also. We're working with a uh, company called The Retail Coach. Here's that trade area I was talking about. And they're working to not only provide that data to us, but to do that recruitment around the, around the bypass, to bring in those um, Jimmy Johns and those kind of things that want, the, uh, want new facilities that they're going to build. Uh, they want the traffic counts, so you're never going to get that around the public square. Because, but around the bypass, you've got 14 to 20,000 cars screaming by there a day. Uh, there's opportunities there. The other cool thing that, that I mentioned that we're working on, this is one of those lean and mean things that we're trying. Uh, there's a beautiful, well, maybe beautiful is not the right word, an interesting historic building right across from the Fusion Theater. It was built in 1937 as um, a JCPenney store. And um, 
It was purchased by the former director of the Buchanan Art Center uh, with the idea of turning it into an artist studio space. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to do an experiment. We're going to do two things in there. We're going to take this, it's got this gorgeous mezzanine, and that's going to become individually rentable artist studios. And then on the main level, we're creating what they call a maker space, which is a community space based around the whole do-it-yourself methodology. There's going to be woodworking tools, computers, CNC routers, 3D printers. Multi-generations of people can come together and experiment and build things and learn from each other. And the whole idea is to create this community space. This can be shared by both the community and the college because you know, the college doesn't quite have all the studio space they need for their seniors. They can have artist space up here. And then if you're coming to the community, you can walk in here and go, wow, look at all these artists working. Look at all this cool stuff that's happening. But we're doing this on the lean and mean first. We're going to try it this fall uh, with just a minimal investment to make sure that, that that interest is there as we think it is. Once it is, then we can make a plan to really renovate that building. The other exciting thing that we're doing, and this is a long game, because uh, some of the stuff you're trying to get done in a year or two, but one of the biggest challenges that you have with any rural community is what they call brain drain. Your best and brightest graduate high school or graduate Monmouth College, they leave the community, they never come back. The CEO program stands for Creating Entrepreneurial Opportunities. It's a program uh, coming out of um, Effingham, Illinois, and it's, it's a national program right now where you take juniors and seniors in high school, and at the start of every school day, five days a week, they spend the first 90 minutes of that day not in school, but in a business. Learning business skills, learning how to write business plans, seeing the businesses that are in the region, in the county. They work together as a class to create their own class business. And then by the end of the school year, they each create their own individual businesses and there's a trade show. And they have to actually, I mean, it's a competitive process. The students have to wear business casual to school to be able, because it's, we take this very seriously. And so we've got this on the books to see if we can get it started um, in fall of 2017. The cool thing is, because you all hear about how challenging education is now, this program is already aligned with the National Entrepreneurship Education Standards and the Common Core, and it costs the school nothing. There are no school resources. It's all funded by regional businesses, and it has a half-time dedicated person that facilitates all that. The idea of this is not necessarily to get the high school students starting businesses permanently, but to get them thinking about what it means to run a business. Think about opportunity recognition. And so maybe when they go off to college, they can also realize when they're done, wow, I learned about all these businesses that were in Warren County and Monmouth. Maybe I should go back and start one, or buy one, or be part of another business. So it's a long play to try to get those people coming back. Uh, this, giving you guys a super preview look, this is the new city website that's actually going to launch on Tuesday. Even the city council hasn't seen this yet. It's exciting. We, have, we, we, we take great pride in sort of our web presence, but part of the whole thing is branding, making it seem like uh, your businesses, your community, your organizations are as professional as possible. And one of my secret little uh, missions is having as many cool websites for businesses and organizations in Monmouth as possible. Because if you don't know Monmouth and you're looking at the web, you go, wow, that community has it going on. And like the college's website is awesome. It's gone through some facelifts, and it is just gorgeous right now. Another cool thing that we've got to help with that downtown, those buildings, is we put together a matching grant program for our uh, facades. Um, this is kind of cool. I've got Lobie's picture up here, because Lobie and I built this program together. Uh, when she was down in, uh, in Danville, Kentucky, um, she was very active on the architectural review board there, where they had facade programs and grant programs. Uh, this is Danville, Kentucky right here. They've got beautiful, old, mature buildings that they've restored, and we worked together to put together a 50-50 matching grant program that building owners can take advantage of. And some examples, here are some restor restored facades. This uh, is on the square. This is the old patent block building. This whole facade has been rebuilt, but it looks like an old historic facade. This is that mod speckle bellies I was telling you about. And it was the old model in the, can the candy company store. It's got black porcelain bricks up here, uh, restored cream-colored stained glass. You can do things that are modern and energy efficient, but still look historic. But if you look at like some of these buildings downtown, 
you can see what needs to be done. One of the things the facade grant could do is replace these kind of steel things up here, restore the windows. Same thing over here. If you go downtown and look around at some of the upper floors, there's some great opportunities. Basically, the way the program works is the, uh, the building owner applies, says, this is what I want to do. We have a historical uh, construction expert go out and uh, meet with them. And if it can be done within their budget, it gets approved by the city council. They do the work, show the receipts, and the city will write them a check for 50% of that. So it's just one of those ways to try to catalyze people to make those buildings look beautiful, because if they look beautiful, people want to linger downtown, they'll want to look around, businesses won't want to be located there. So this is the cool stuff I'm going to show you right here. This is, we, we hired a firm out of Chicago called House Seal Levine Associates to reimagine the public spaces downtown, the whole idea of streetscaping. So the first thing we're going to do is super simple. If you're downtown at all, check out Market Alley. It's a beautiful public space that we've got, but our first thing, because it's cheap, you like to do cheap stuff first, we're going to do uh, cafe lights across that. So when you're there, imagine what that's going to look like. But here's the big one. This is the public square, the roundabout. This is where we want to go. This is the, uh, the big ticket item, but this is the transformational thing for downtown. It's leaving the roundabout, but adding all these wonderful green spaces and actually slowing down the traffic by having these little one-way parking areas. This increases the parking by 50%, gets rid of the asphalt and, and concrete by about 50%, manages runoff and drainage, um, and slows the traffic down so it's safer. And then what do I mean by that? Well, here's, here's a top-down view of coming into the square. Notice now, when you, and if you've driven the roundabout, you know it's kind of like a wide earth's wild west out there. Um, if you're a pedestrian, just run. Uh, but it's basically taking it so that cars only enter the roundabout one lane at a time, so there's no like jockeying for like pole position or anything like that. And pedestrians never have to cross more than one lane of traffic at a time before they get like a, either a boulevard or a rest area, which is gonna make it much safer. And then you can take all of these areas and turn those into permeable pavers that will retain water. Um, here's another example of a place where we couldn't, this is uh, First Street and First Avenue. Uh, if you ever hung out at Woodshed Bar, there it is. Um, this is basically taking a spot where we had to tear down a building that was too bad shape, it couldn't be renovated, but we're gonna turn it into a mixed use parking space and green space. and. Uh, it kind of ties together this whole first street area with the whole downtown. Um, this is an example of what South Main is going to look like. Um, that's the old Bowman building. Um, but adding a boulevard and kind of shrinking down the traffic a bit, because right now South Main is six lanes wide. There's no reason it needs to be six lanes wide. And then you can add cool things like a crosswalk in the middle of the block. Again, pedestrians only crossing one lane at a time, and you've got this, you start creating this beautiful area where downtown is cool to walk in. The buildings are cool to look at, the downtown is awesome. That's just a parking lot by the city, but it's just showing, if you do some landscaping and some permeable pavers, you can make even an ugly parking lot look beautiful. So, last thing, I got a couple more things to show you, uh, then we'll have some time for some questions, but I wanted to show you a couple of the buildings that you may be familiar with in the downtown area. Uh, we did this last year, um, kind of like Jeff was showing what was going on with campus. Uh, this is the Second National Bank. This I showed it to you before. This is it from about, what, the early 1900s, you think? And this is what it looks like now, almost identical. And I have to point out this, because you've probably seen online uh, the whole thing about Photoshopping photos. This has got to be one of the first Photoshop photos. Look at the people here. And then look at the car over there. These people are about like that tall. I don't know. I guess they did, did that to make this building seem more imposing or something like that. Because there's a regular person over there, and he'd be like 18 feet tall. Uh, there's the Fusion Theater, where, when was this, Jeff? Maybe 1920s or something? Here it was just before it became the Fusion Theater. And it had the award as the ugliest building in downtown. Uh, and now it's this gorgeous space. Uh, the old Gambles warehouse is now a company called uh, Cornelius that they refurbish Coke machines. It's owned by Warren Buffett, of all things. 
Uh, there's also a business in there that I didn't know about when I put this on last year that does super high-end hand lotion, like champagne hand lotion. So, you know, if you it, it, mix that with the smell of bacon, it's just it's wonderful. <laughs> Uh, again, Marcadelli Wines, plug, a great place for a glass of wine. But that used to be the Bowman Shoe Store. Uh, the airport. Here's what the airport used to look like. The airport today, um, it's home to, in the summertime, to a lot of ag flying. In uh, July and August, per capita, it's the busiest airport in the state of Illinois. Because you've got these ag planes flying about 23 hours a day, take off thousands and thousands of takeoffs and landings. Dairy Queen, long time ago, not so long ago, and this is the new Dairy Queen right now. It's, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, you probably remember Mellings, and now the American Inn is there, and it's actually, I mean, that's a really wonderful, probably the best hotel within 50 miles. And last thing I want to do, I'm gonna, I want to show you one quick little thing here, and let's see if I can do this. This is doing AV stuff, and if I can manage it. I wanted to show you guys a video. We put this together, the city did, um, as a way to kind of promote what we're trying to do over the next couple of years. It's only 90 seconds long, but I figured it'd be kind of a good way to end. So if I can make this work. That was Bacon Fest, by the way. So that's all we've got. Uh, questions, anyone? Oh yeah, if you're downtown, um, obviously, uh, if you go down Public Square, there's Market Alley Wines. Uh, I know the owner, she's awesome. Uh, right next to it's a place called Pints, Paintings, and More, uh, which has uh, really cool handmade furniture and artwork. Oh, that's my wife talking. I don't know what's going on here, okay. <laughs> um, there is Mod Speckle Bellies, which is on Broadway and First. Um, there's MC Sport, which is a really cool, uh, it's in the old Woolworth store. It's got like um, team sports apparel and stuff, but they've got like retro Scots, like jerseys and stuff like that. It's a really cool store. They're trying to restore like the old, uh, um, the old Woolworths used to be. And... Um, the Bijou Pub is another great place to, to have a drink, and they have like really good bar food. I mean, really good bar food. And uh, there's, just take a little walk around, check things out. And Jeff and I are available for some questions if you got any. Just thinking, if only we could have saved Connell's, huh? <laughs> I know what you mean. Though I, though I will say when it was Econo Foods, they did everything possible to drive customers away from that business. <laughs> If you go to the Chamber of Commerce, they have them, yeah, they've got uh, fold-out maps that you can go, and that's, the Chamber of Commerce is right on the square there. Any other questions? There's some of Bowers Hall. Oh, good, excellent. Well, thank you guys so much for your attention, and have a great rest of your time here.